Lecture 21, Performance Case Study and Performance Culture. Uh, so we're going to start off this topic by taking a look at, well, Firefox Quantum. Uh, it falls in with the idea of talking about Rust and what have you, um, but also represents a large software project that was slow and needed to be improved to be better. Uh, I think there's no getting around the fact that you know, for a significant period of time, Firefox was really slow as a browser, uh, and this made it less desirable for people to use. Um, certainly, um, you know, even without prompting, uh, average users, uh, I'm thinking in particular of my parents here who are not particularly sophisticated as computer users, they switched from Firefox to Chrome because they said, well, Firefox is really slow and they heard Chrome was better. Uh, and they weren't wrong. But uh, in, in any case, um, you know, the Mozilla team uh, really uh, took great pains to speed up Firefox. So let's talk about that a bit. So here are some ways that, uh, that Firefox actually improved things, uh, and all of them are easily categorized into one of the uh, strategies that we talked about way back at the beginning uh, of the course, and, and those are things like do less work, uh, or you know, do it in advance, so being prepared, uh, or making use of threads, distributing the work, taking advantage of the hardware that we have available, uh, or uh, just keeping track of performance and you know, deciding that oh this change is you know not approved because it makes performance worse. So um, here's some here's some examples of uh, things that they did. Um, so number one, don't animate out of view elements. Right when you're viewing a page, you know, the page could be significantly larger than is shown in the window. Uh, that is uh, know, the view that the user sees and animating things that are outside of that view is just wasting effort because nobody can see it right it's outside the view you know it's it's down the page you know it's in the page footer uh, but you're not looking at the page footer because you're looking at the top of the page don't animate that you're just wasting CPU time you know, drawing those things uh, even though nobody can see it so uh, that's that's a good example of do less work. Um, move database initialization off the main thread. Um, Firefox has a little internal database where it keeps track of some things. Moving that to a new thread uh, just makes a certain amount of sense uh, because you don't really have to wait for it, but it was holding up uh, startup of the um, of the app. Uh, and honestly, starting of the application is a big part of what users perceive as slow versus fast. Uh, that if you click on the Firefox icon and it opens very quickly, then people will think it's pretty fast. Um, obviously, you know, there's more to it than that. If it loads pages very slowly, that's also going to be a problem. Um, but that first impression is important. It matters um, as far as the user is concerned. Uh, and so anything you could do that would help with that is going to be beneficial. Uh, next on the list is uh, keeping better profiling data, as we talked about uh, in the subject of uh, improving the compiler. Uh, if you have good data about what your performance uh, looks like, you'll know if the change that you are about to introduce has a really negative effect on performance, uh, and that might convince you to not do that, or perhaps rework it a little bit until such time as performance is acceptable. Uh, parallel painting for Mac OS, this is just taking better advantage of the platform's uh, options that you have. Um, you know, if you know how to use the API correctly, then uh, it is is going to potentially uh, end up being a better um, better outcome for the user. I mean, uh, it's not as though you know the operating system did anything wrong, but if you weren't using it in the most efficient way, um, you know the user is the one that suffers uh, as a result of that. Uh, lazily instantiate the search service that is only started up when it's actually needed. Uh, again, this just pushes off later the uh, startup of the search service. Maybe the user doesn't need it when they start the browser and uh, um, the slowing down the launch of the browser is quite noticeable. Uh, so putting it off until it's needed is uh, going to be better uh, in that regard. 
have the size of the block list. This is a data structure where we are you know, caching some data, you know, containing some stuff, uh, and it is a good example of changing the configuration parameters of your program based on what your experiments show. Uh, in previous topic, we talked about doing so automatically, but you know, there's also the manual approach, uh, and in the manual approach, you don't just try some different options and you see what works the best, and you say, you say all right, well, you know, this data structure should have a smaller capacity. Uh, the smaller capacity presumably makes it easier to search, um, well, at least faster to search, uh, and probably is uh, not much loss in terms of uh, how much uh, data is practically used in it, uh, because if most elements in it are unused, then having it be half the size really doesn't cost you very much. Next, uh, refactor to reduce main thread I.O. Uh, as we know, I.O. is typically blocking, so we're usually waiting for it, uh, and it's better if we don't do that and we just push it off to another thread, uh, and we collect the result from that other thread when it is ready, uh, thus potentially allowing us to go on and start some other things and allow stuff to run in parallel as we might wish. Uh, don't hold all frames of animated GIF uh, or animated PNG in memory. Uh, and yes, I'm certain that is the correct pronunciation of GIF. Uh, why does this help? Well, they can be pretty big when it's uh, when it comes down to it, and uh, you know, keeping every frame of this image in memory uh, is not always going to be beneficial, particularly if you don't want it to play in a loop. If you know, you play it once and, and you then stop it or something, keeping all the frames of it in memory when it's stopped you know, at the final frame doesn't make sense. Uh, you are, again, just you know, taking up space that's not very useful, and you don't want that. Uh, it would be better to use that memory for something else, uh, because, well, although memory in your computer is uh, large, it's not infinite, and you know, anything that could reduce swapping is beneficial. Uh, eliminating an unnecessary hash table. Uh, evidently, there is uh, some work being done here that served no purpose, so get rid of it. Um, that's one of the easiest things you could do. You know, if we don't need it anymore, delete it. One of my favorite refactorings, and uh, you know, it's, it's always nice when you can put up a PR where all the lines are red. That's... Uh, those ones are easiest to review. Um, one of the uh, projects that I commit to has like a, a README thing that you put in the um, PR description. It has some boxes to tick, whether, you know, have you done you know, manual tests? Have you done unit tests? Uh, are there functional tests? That kind of thing. And on the you know, kind of PR where I delete things, then I tick the box that says, this is a deletion only PR. You know, I don't have to write any tests for the new code in it because there's no new code in it. It is only deletions, uh, and you know, software uh, can improve by taking things away. Okay, um, and then uh, use a more modern compiler. As we've seen when we talk about compiler optimizations, that's one of the things that you could do because uh, a better compiler can do better optimizations and you get more performance uh, for uh, not quite free as we've seen, but uh, pretty close to it. Uh, and using a better compiler is you know, a great way to get the benefit of all the work that has gone into writing that compiler. So by all means, you know, use the up-to-date one. Yeah, so as we've discussed, we've seen all of those things before. The uh, uh, ideas can all be categorized broadly into one of the uh, strategies, like do less work, um, use threads, measure performance, uh, and you can think about uh, which ones are which. Uh, some of them may fall into more than one category even. Um, so here's a uh, here's another idea that I think is kind of interesting. Uh, and this one is in the category of be prepared um, and tab warming. Uh, and uh, Mike Conley says, maybe this is my canadian is showing, but I like to think of it as almost like coming in from shoveling snow off the driveway and somebody inside has already made hot chocolate for you because they knew you'd probably be cold. Hmm. It's very thoughtful of such a person. No, um, how does tab warming work? Okay, so um, when the system does not have tab warming. If you are switching between tabs, you know, you click on the tab that you want to go to, you know, I'm 
clicking on this tab in Learn, uh, and it brings up Learn, right? Um, Firefox would request a paint of the newly active tab uh, and then wait for the result before switching so that when the, the view goes over to the new tab, you get there and it's got data, it's got something to show you already. It doesn't switch you to like a blank page and then it draws all the elements because that would be silly. And the idea behind tab warming is predicting uh, an imminent tab switch. Uh, and the question I have for you is, how would you predict the future? Um, you know, they, there's two related questions here. One is, how do you know that the user is going to switch tabs? Uh, and then the next question is, uh, if you know that they're going to switch tabs, how do you know which one they're going to switch to? Well, when the user has a mouse, then the mouse cursor will, for some brief period of time, hover over the tab that you're going to select before the click actually happens, right? From human perspective, it's pretty quick. You know, I move my mouse there, I click, it doesn't feel like there's any delay, but for the computer, there's some time in there. So what do we do? Uh, and assuming a sufficiently long delay between hover and click, the tab switch could be perceived by the user as instantaneous. Uh, if the delay is non-zero, then, uh, but not long enough, we will nonetheless shave some time off in eventually presenting the tab to you. So if you move your mouse cursor over the tab, uh, then, well, Firefox is going to conclude it is likely that you want to switch to that tab. That could be correct, it could be incorrect. Um, if correct, we save time. Uh, if incorrect, then the second part of this quote comes up. And in the event we were wrong and you weren't interested in seeing the tab, we eventually throw the uploaded layers away. That is, the, the rendered layers uh, away. So if you move the mouse uh, over the tab, it thinks you're probably going there, and most of the time that's probably true. If it is, save time. Don't, uh, don't need to wait as long for the content to be rendered. Uh, and if you're wrong, well, we did a little bit of extra work, but you know, it wasn't uh, wasn't the worst thing that could happen, right? Uh, um, maybe. Uh, I mean, maybe you're disappointed that you know this this extra work is you know, unnecessary and could be avoided, and you think that's inefficient. Um, that hurts, I guess, a little bit more you know, on a uh, mobile device where you know, that's consuming some battery for something that wasn't necessary. Um, but uh, ultimately, I think the uh, amount of it is relatively small, so uh, it is unlikely to be uh, you know, make or break uh, on whether your battery lasts you the day or not. Uh, but of course, it really depends on, uh, on how much browsing you're doing uh, and how often you switch tabs and how often you give hints that you're going to switch tabs. The blog post that describes this performance improvement doesn't give uh, a breakdown of performance numbers. Uh, however, it does give you uh, a uh, an, a bug item that's number one four three zero one six zero, giving a discussion about how you would collect that data if you were interested in collecting it. Uh, but just you know, thinking about it at a high level, it seems like this would be a win. Uh, because most likely if you hover over a tab, you're going to click on it. And if you click on it, you want to go there. And uh, if we've already uh, done a little bit of work to prepare for that, uh, it seems like a win. So yeah, absolutely. Let's do it. Uh, and then there is, well, Firefox in general. And uh, in, if you type about colon Mozilla uh, in Firefox, then on a quantum flow uh, enabled version, you see this. I guess I could do a dramatic reading. The beast adopted new raiment and studied the ways of time and space and light and the flow of energy through the universe. From its studies, the beast fashioned new structures from oxidized metal and proclaimed their glories. And the beast's followers rejoiced, finding renewed purpose in these teachings. All right, that makes it sound, you know, fancy and dramatic in, in a way that's that maybe a little bit overselling it. Um, this is just a fancy way of saying that, you know, they now use Rust. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, if we make it sound dramatic and cool, uh, you know, that, I don't know, people enjoy it more. Um, Maybe, uh, I suppose if uh, you know, I had uh, more renown, uh, I could see if I could get one of those movie trailer guys to, 
to do a, a reading of it. In a world where people like to browse the internet. Yeah, uh, I'll stop there. Uh, in 2017, um, Mozilla released the Electrolysis uh project uh, and this is uh, about using multiple operating system level processes uh, whereas um, you know in in other uh, browsers you might have one process uh, per tab uh, such as Chrome um, where we have you know, one process per tab meaning that if you know, a, a tab dies it doesn't take down the whole application uh, Firefox used to have one process per tab uh, that seems to have been uh, broken down a little bit. Uh, and what we have instead is uh, some processes, uh, and each process has a few tabs. Um, this is intending to keep sort of uh, memory usage down. Uh, and of course, there were internal architecture issues uh, in splitting everything up and having them communicate across multiple processes, but have also threads within each process. Um, and there was also some difficulty with uh, add-ons or uh, web extensions. Which were somewhat, um, which were somewhat complicated. Uh, however, it is sometimes the case that uh, um, browser designers just say, you know what, we're going to break uh, previous extensions because it's like impractical to um, support them always and forever. Uh, and if people want to have a new extension or a, a, a particular extension to continue working, they're just going to have to update and build with the you know, new restrictions and new tools. Uh, and so that can happen. Uh, and you do sometimes see that like, oh, this old extension that you really liked, sorry, it's no longer supported. And, you know, you can be uh, disappointed by that. Um, but they're kind of under no obligation to keep compatibility. So they could break it if they want to. And sometimes they do. So yeah, although Chrome is one process per tab, um, you know Firefox is multiplexing across uh, the four content pro uh, processes, uh, and limiting the number of tabs um, also limits the memory consumption of the browser uh, because we don't have arbitrary numbers uh, of renderer state. Um, and yeah, the uh, electrolysis project, you know, in a crude summary, works by splitting across processes, uh, and the quantum flow stuff is intended for uh, improvement within a single process. Uh, and um, yeah, we're uh, we're focusing on Rust now. Previous versions of the course talked about uh, you know quantum flow using the Rust programming language and Rust being a future revision of the ECE four five nine curriculum. But the future is now. Okay, so how did quantum flow uh, actually work? Well, um, based on a blog post uh, that's linked in the notes, a quick retrospective of the project. Uh, here's some things that we learned. Um, the basic strategy was measure things that are slow and identify them. Uh, and then uh, we're going to gather help. That is, uh, reach out to other people in the Mozilla organization uh, and get them to contribute. You know, they will have performance improvements, so the, the front end team uh, will focus on things that are you know, in the front end. Uh, you know, the layout team will focus on things uh, in, uh, in their area, uh, and so on and so on. Uh, and then fix all, no, okay, not all, some of the things, right? Um, you're never going to be able to fix all bugs in a software project. Uh, that seems kind of impractical. Uh, and most likely there will always be uh, newer and more important things to do over, you know, that old bug that happens, you know, once every seven years to somebody running Windows Vista. You know, that, that won't happen very often, so you don't sweat it too much. Um, but over a six-month period of time, they looked at uh, about 895 bugs, of which they fixed 369. Okay, um, if the, they were the you know 369 most important bugs, then that's definitely an improvement. Um, there's no um, there's no way that every one of those 895 bugs was actually uh, you know the most important. You know that all things were equally beneficial, uh, and you can get a lot of benefit from you know fixing the top 10 most important ones uh, if they are. Um, you know, if they are the ones that are causing most of the slowdown, um, but fixing 369 is pretty good. So um, they've got some uh, telemetry that shows you a little bit 
uh, how it's done. Uh, but it's also important to note that after this uh, quantum project wound down, the goal was to distribute responsibility for performance improvements across the entire project uh, in the same way that you can't you know, just outsource unit testing and say like, oh, we have the unit testing team and it's their job to write unit tests for all the code that other people write. You know, that's not real practical and is not super effective. Uh, and the goal was to make uh, performance everybody's responsibility uh, after the project uh, was finished. Okay, and what about telemetry? Well, telemetry is based on the idea that although you can you know, have your own benchmarks and have your own test suite and have your own uh, data collection that you do internally when you, you know, create a debug build and you run a debug build and all those things, it's not the same thing as people actually using the browser in real life. Um, and so Firefox is collecting lots of data, and we're talking you know, hundreds of gigabytes of anonymous metrics per day, uh, and uh, uses this information as its input to figure out like what's going on, um, what is fast, what is slow, what might need changing, uh, if anything, you know, what's going well even. Um, you could think of this as being like you know, CPU profiling, uh, just at a you know very broad and distributed scope. Um, I mean, that's only an analogy, so it you know, breaks down at least a little bit. Um, but you know, we're we're looking at collecting absolutely everything, uh, and uh, we could actually take a look and see some stuff that is collecting uh, in the uh, in the browser if we go to the about colon telemetry. Uh, I don't know if it's a page, but uh, the uh, about telemetry um, location. And here we'll take a uh, shallow dive into the uh, telemetry that we've got on our, uh, on our browser. Uh, and this is just my Firefox install uh, under Mac OS. Uh, and it gives you a, a nice little blurb here about um, what's going on. And it tells you whether it's enabled or not. You do have your choice. Uh, Mozilla is kind enough to at least attempt respecting your privacy in a way that other uh, platforms don't. Uh, and so... Um, yeah, I think that's actually valuable. Uh, but you can ask about general data. It'll tell you, you know, the version at the, at the time. This is version 85. I, I think that's the latest. Um, uh, you can ask it about you know, environment data, all that stuff. Um, um, I don't think anybody cares too much about that. Uh, but the histograms are actually the interesting ones. Uh, and um, histograms say, you know, here's where time is going. Uh, and here's uh, what happens most commonly, uh, you know, garbage collection, um, mm -hmm. lots, lots of fun stuff there. Uh, it can also tell you about extensions, if uh, extensions are taking up a lot of time or doing anything weird or strange. Um, we can watch events. Um, Slow uh, SQL statements. That one's actually interesting. I mentioned earlier there's a little database in Firefox. It, it appears uh, to be SQLite. Um, and tracking which of your queries are slow is actually valuable because you could decide to optimize based on that. Um, again, if you've taken a database course, um, you might have talked about the idea of you know, indexing and uh, what, you know, what is the impact of that. Uh, and so you might determine that you know, this particular slow query here, you know, well, you know, it's slow because we forgot to add an index on you know, some key column or something like that. It'd be easy to, uh, easy to fix. Um, and yeah, there's fun stuff. Uh, memory distribution among content. Uh, Network HTTP redirect, SSL time until handshake finished, uh, all kinds of fun stuff. Most of which doesn't matter, I think, to the average user in any normal scenario. But if you are a Firefox developer, then this kind of thing matters to you because uh, it, if it falls within your area, you have sufficient data to identify what is fast and what is slow for actual users when they're using it for real. Uh, and not just you know with your test data set browsing your test websites to you know, check out uh, basic functionality. Uh, there's no scenario more real than the real world. We can also go to their website telemetry.mozilla.org uh, and uh, you can actually see some of the things. Uh, you know, some of them are a little bit restricted, um, but you can 
do some interesting you know, discovery of uh, sort of data analysis. Uh, and so here is time spent running the JavaScript garbage collector in milliseconds, and we have a nice histogram with you know, a, a reasonable distribution. Uh, and so if you were to make a change in, say, the JavaScript rendering engine, this might be a metric that you care about. It would give you a good breakdown of whether or not the uh, change is better or worse, or if something is getting worse over time. Uh, knowing about that would be important so that you could consider it a priority. Uh, I mean, this is over the, the period of uh, from, from uh, 14th of December 2020 to 27th of December 2020. You could, of course, choose a different time frame. Uh, and uh, you know, you, you, they've got nice breakdowns of, uh, of everything here. Uh, if you are so inclined uh, and you can even tinker with these kinds of things if you want you know cumulative mode and uh, you know, spill bucket um, for anything that doesn't fit in if it's a categorical histogram uh, and you can also look at the uh, evolution over time uh, so let's see it's, uh, it's going to take a minute to load but we can wait uh, and yeah, you know, I mean, uh, what what do we see here? That uh, over over the course of time, uh, there is like a very slight decreasing trend. Uh, maybe not significant, but you know, uh, it could be worse. Uh, but also uh, looking at the uh, nightly builds for Firefox 86, it seems like it's actually going down uh, in a way that might even be meaningful. Uh, now, you know, these couple here might be outliers for some reason, but it sounds like um, uh, it sounds like they are taking some effort to actually reduce the uh, garbage collector time for JavaScript, uh, and you can observe that even in real time, uh, as we see here. And here are a few uh, questions that uh, can be answered using the Firefox telemetry. Uh, number one is Firefox the user's default browser. Well, for people who use Firefox, apparently amongst 69% of them, yes. Um, does the electrolysis project make uh, startup faster? No, actually, it makes it a little bit slower. It might still be worth doing, even though it you know, does have uh, a little bit of startup cost. Uh, and which plugins tend to freeze the browser on load? Silverlight and Flash, both of which uh, have, you know, since... Uh, the start of collection of data, gone to the trash heap of history, and I don't know that anybody will really miss them. So uh, in that sense, uh, you know, we no longer have a problem. So that's good. Uh, and of course, we see the uh, uh, evolution of data over time. Uh, and Firefox developers can propose new uh, probes. However, uh, there is an extra step of reviewing them for data privacy, uh, as well as you know the normal code reviews that take place. Uh, and Firefox does have uh, a web page where they talk about their data collection processes, and a lot of it is opt out if you wish, uh, which again, as I say, is much better than uh, you could expect from certain other companies making other software products. You know, not naming any names, but uh, you, you know who I mean. Um, Firefox also uh, will, again, uh, if allowed, check in, uh, you know, sending a ping uh, every 24 hours at least uh, upon shutdown, environment change, and crash. Uh, and these are just little, um, little packages of data uh, sent in JSON format to a central server, uh, which gives you, um, you know, well, gives you the... Uh, gives Firefox, uh, gives Mozilla, uh, an overview of the data that the uh, browser wants to report in its telemetry. So here's you know, the uh, histograms, um, counts of things, you know, scalars, um, booleans, uh, configuration uh, that, again, anonymized is important to them. Uh, and that's how they will collect the data that they are looking for. Uh, and uh, you know, it is hopefully compressed, but certainly sent to Mozilla in that regard. Uh, and it has a sort of somewhat common structure. It's JSON, so hopefully it looks familiar to you, and it is kind of uh, extensible in the sense that you could easily add new properties, and then you know, if uh, other uh, clients are looking at it uh, internally at Mozilla and they don't need it, they can just ignore uh, a data element that they don't care about and the new one doesn't really cause any problems because you know, that's how we do serialization these days. 
Yep, uh, and it contains so uh, scalars, which are you know, counts of things, so how many crashes there have been, um, and histograms, bucketed data, like we saw earlier with the uh, garbage collection runtime for uh, JavaScript. That would be something that would you know, be in the histogram data uh, to give you a uh, give you a uh, overview based on the data that we've observed uh, when we have many many observations.